Hello good people, Snow's here for Hardware Canucks, and obviously, you guys heard the news. AMD announced the Ryzen 7000 family of CPUs and their 600 series of motherboards a couple of days ago. But you guys already watched the event, so instead of repeating the exact same thing that AMD already said, I'll answer a few questions that were asked to me, explore beyond the presentation, and get to things AMD didn't touch on. All right, let's first tackle the platform lifespan. AMD specified that AM5 would be supported through 2025 and beyond. For some reason though, I've heard conflicting information coming from other YouTubers. So which one is it? Well, what AMD is saying is that the AM5 platform will be supported for the next three years and three months. What isn't clear is of course the chipsets. Are X670 and B650 motherboards going to be compatible with CPUs that come out in 2025? That unfortunately, AMD didn't clarify. Hopefully we don't get a repeat of what happened with AM4 where the messaging was all over the place and AMD just ended up enabling the newest CPU on oldest motherboards. Then we have AMD Expo. What is it? Well, it stands for Extended Profiles for Overclocking. It's basically the same thing as XMP for Intel, EOCP, and DOCP. It allows the motherboard to read the overclocked memory settings from the stick of RAM and automatically apply it to the stick of RAM. The only difference is that it comes directly from AMD. DOCP was an ASUS thing made for AMD, and EOCP was made by Gigabyte. And of course, there's XMP, which is for Intel. Oh, and by the way, it looks like the uh, clock speed for the Infinity Fabric really is 3 GHz. AMD used some DDR5 6000 memory for their benchmark. That has to be the new sweet spot for performance. I mean, they wouldn't benchmark outside of the sweet spot. Speaking of memory, that sweet spot that I talked about earlier, well, it might only be achievable if you're running two sticks of RAM. Don't believe me? Well, in AMD's own documentation, the Ryzen 7000 memory controller officially supports up to DDR5-5200, but only when using two sticks of RAM with one or two ranks each. If you ever decide to go with four sticks of RAM, so let's say you buy two now and two later, or you just go with four sticks off the bat, the official supported speed drops dramatically to DDR5-3600. That's just crazy. Now, it's not unheard of that four sticks can reduce the compatible memory speeds, but this 3600, it's lower than pretty much anything on the market. I mean, DDR5 made its debut at 4800 mega transfers per second. Now, does that mean that you're limited by DDR5-3600? No, but it does mean that anything above it is considered overclocking and any instability here will not be supported by AMD. Wow. Speaking of memory, or I guess cache, we got the L2. You might've noticed that uh, in AMD's presentation, the overall cache increased, and not in the way that it did with the 5800X3D. They actually doubled the L2. Now, why would AMD double the L2 cache, but not the L3 using their 3D stacking technology? Well, first, don't you worry, these 3D chips are definitely incoming, but I believe that the reason was simply, well, cost. They asked themselves, how can I get more performance out of cache without having every single chip in the lineup stacked? Since L2 takes up less space than L3 and provides a huge performance increase in terms of uh, keeping the CPU fed with information, the doubling of L2 was a better idea. Once again though, the 3D chips are incoming probably going to get announced this year for an early 2023 release, but I'm just speculating here. Something that was literally not brought up during this event was the integrated graphics. Yep, every single Ryzen 7000 series processor from the 7950X down will have an integrated GPU. I mean, don't get me wrong, they won't be gaming worthy. AMD said so themselves. But it doesn't mean that you should completely gloss over it, AMD. This is important stuff. All the CPUs have the same encode and decode capabilities of RDNA 2, and it would be great for basic systems once lower end products start to come out. Plus, it's such a godsend when your computer goes blank and you just wonder if it's the GPU or something else in the system. Then let's talk pricing. We actually have a discount for you from our sponsors. Be quiet, take it away, Dimitri. 
Be Quiet and listen to the FX. Introducing the only way to FX with Be Quiet Pure Base 500 FX, an awesome mid tower made even more special with four Lightwings high speed fans controlled via the hub, so no need to stress the motherboard. The Pure Loop 2 FX is very much an eye candy with ARGB fans and pump illumination, with the Pure Rock 2 FX following in lighting footsteps to celebrate Be Quiet's 20 year brand anniversary. And if you order now at Select Partners, you can save $30. Wow, making quiet the noise. Check out the effects down below. Back to rising pricing though, this one is a little tough. Not because the CPU prices have changed a bit, but mostly because the cost of entry just skyrocketed. Let's start with the CPUs. The 7950X got a nice rebate down to $699. The 7900X is the same price as its predecessor. The 7700X is $399, so $50 cheaper than the price the 5800X launched at. And lastly, we have the 7600X, same price as its predecessor, $299. If we roll back to let's say late 2021, you could get a B550 motherboard for $55, a CPU for $300, and a killer DDR4 kit for $80 to $90. Basically hovering around $450 and you've got your three core components. If we talk about now and we price it out, motherboards are apparently starting at an eye-watering $125. The CPU is still $300 and the sweet spot memory, that DDR5 6000 kit is at $240 we're looking at almost a 50% price increase. And sure, DDR5 is definitely gonna go down in price, but the sweet spot memory will probably stay pretty high. Now, the 7600X didn't go up in price when compared to the 5600X, but AMD is not including a cooler with this one anymore. And yeah, I know, a lot of you guys just take that boxed cooler and throw it in the garbage, especially on something like a 7700X or above. But a lot of folks count on lower priced CPUs like this one to help them stay on budget or even plan on upgrading later but need a temporary solution now. So yeah, no heatsink. Something else that you might have missed is the B650 Extreme making an appearance. Remember this little announcement from AMD during Computex with uh, three different motherboards? There's the X670E, the X670, and B650. Basically, the X670 series was supposed to get PCIe Gen 5 for both storage and graphics, while B650 would only get it on storage. Now, for some reason though, the B650 Extreme is being introduced for people who want a more budget-friendly motherboard, but don't want to sacrifice Gen 5 graphics or SSD. So what's the difference between the B650 Extreme and regular X670? I'm not sure. They both are pretty much the same thing, but it's probably going to come down to IO. Then we have something else that's important to remember. It's that all Ryzen 7000 CPUs have TDPs that are about 50% up from the last generation. 50%, but at least there's a pretty good reason for this. They pushed frequencies far beyond what Zen 3 could ever hit for both base and boost clocks. Now, one of these chips goes under five gigahertz and even the base frequency has shot up by about a gigahertz in every case. Now, sure, some of the performance improvements comes from the IPC enhancements, but most of it comes from the raw clock speed. And since power and frequency don't scale linearly, power actually ramps up faster, it means more power consumed from the uh, entire lineup. The 76 and 7700X are both 105 watts. Ryzen 9 goes up to 170 watts, though we'll probably have to wait to see their actual power consumption. Now, here's the kicker about this power to frequency scaling. A lower wattage Zen 4 CPU is going to be super, and I mean super efficient if we're to believe AMD. On the desktop side, it doesn't matter at all, but for laptops, this could be absolutely huge. It also makes me wonder what will be able to get when undervolting the desktop CPUs. Now, like I said earlier, we're higher than before on the power side of things. More power means more heat, and with a five nanometer manufacturing process, that means that the heat is concentrated into a tiny little space on the die. AMD has essentially doubled the transistor density of the hottest running section of the chip. And since Zen 3 was already a challenge to cool, Zen 4's design could make it even worse. Basically, with Ryzen 7000, we get one or two super dense areas 
dyes that are gonna get super hot and the dyes are all the way at the edge of the IHS. So there's less IHS space to disperse their heat as efficiently as opposed to, you know, having the dye directly in the center like Intel does it. AMD tried to compensate by making the IHS super thick. At least that's the way it looks like from uh, what I've seen. The thickness should work to distribute any hot spot that pop up, but it can only do so much. Mike already talked to a bunch of heatsink manufacturers and their thoughts are pretty unanimous. The Ryzen 7000 series is going to be very, very challenging to keep cool. Not only that, but AMD's already mentioned that they've moved away from power and clock speed limiters. With Zen 4, it's mostly temperatures. That means lower temperatures can and will mean higher performance. How much higher? Well, I guess we'll have to find out. So yeah. That's all I wanted to share with you guys. Plus, there's Raptor Lake on the horizon that's going to be interesting too. What are your thoughts on all this? Let me know down below. You can click right here to see some other content, right here to subscribe to Boot Sequence. Stay frosty, my dudes, and I'll see you on the next one. Take care.